Hey, so it's time to finish that uh, the garden plan series, planning your garden using Microsoft Excel. I'm back here, Greg Ott, MaritimeGardening.com, and uh, I'm going to finish this off. So last time around, uh, I showed how to take a picture of your garden, plop it into a program like Excel, and label it. Um, so before I continue, I want to answer a couple questions that people uh, threw at me in the comment section. One was, uh, you can't do this in... Uh, other operating systems or what if you don't have Excel you can use any program where you can put a picture in and you can paste text on the picture <laughs> That's, it doesn't have to be Excel uh, it can be anything uh, you can use uh, word pro most word processing programs have a text box um, even if you're not using uh, the Microsoft package if you've got some sort of thing in Linux or whatever there's analogous options. I'm not an expert on Linux, but I know enough to know that. So um, anything you can use where you can put a picture in and you can insert a text box. So whatever that software is, if you're able to paste a picture into it and using that snipping tool, there's other ways to paste pictures in too. I just find the snipping tool is so much easier in so many different ways. Um, but if you don't have it, there's other ways to put uh, pictures into a document. Um, whatever that software is, just Google how do I put a text box in this or how do I label this or whatever and sure someone's figured it out. Uh, so there's that question. Um, not the best answer in the world but there's a, this is just one of many. Uh, the whole point of this is to show you that you can plan your garden without getting special garden planning software. As long as you've got a picture of your garden <laughs> you can plan it out. Uh, pretty low tech. You could even uh, you know, print it off uh, at least here in Canada. You know, times have changed. You can't just get a photograph printed out anymore. But you could even take the picture, print it on a color printer, and just write on it. <laughs> That's all I'm really doing here. I'm just using software to do it. But you could do that too. It doesn't have to be high tech. Lots of different options. Uh, the whole point is to give people alternatives to uh, some sort of specialized software that either costs money or when you install it on your computer, it buggers your computer up with uh, uh, some worm or malware or some other rubbish like that or you have to give up your email to get that software if you're um, concerned about that sort of thing I know I am there's it's just so difficult to know what to trust these days uh, other question was how do I uh, general category of question was so you're looking at uh, my uh, thing here you'll notice I've changed everything so that it, it's just uh, a word without a box actually the box is easier to see and read but for some reason, the black letters look better. <laughs> but who cares how it looks? But anyway, if you, if, you, if you don't like the way this looks and you want it to look like this, um, uh, here's what you do. So you just click on the box and see how it gets these little dot things around it. And move the cursor around until it has this plus, arrow plus type looking thing. And right click. And then you'll get these options. I mean, this is how you do this in Excel. You got all these different options up here, fill, outline. So right now the fill is white, so you just click the little arrow thing there and say no fill. So now there's no fill, but there's still this like little box thing around it. Right? So then that's that's called an outline. So again, get that little plus looking thing, right click, outline, and just say no outline. Now there's no outline. Now that's a bit small. So I want to make that, I'll bold that. And I'll make it a little bit, so just by clicking B, you bold it up here. And uh, there's a, a button here. Uh, a up, A down. It just means make the text bigger, make the text smaller. So you just click that a couple times. Oh, that looks all weird. And you just grab one of these uh, square things and drag, make the box bigger. I don't know if that's the same size. What size is this one? That is 16 point font. This looks more like 18, not 16 too. That looks bigger to me. Anyway, it's the same. It's a longer word. Optical illusion. Okay, so to show that again, go to the box, uh, make it plus like that, right click, change the fill to no fill, change the outline to no outline. Okay, and then you can just again click the box. Make it bold and make it big. Bold and beautiful. There you go. Now, of course, there's a much easier way to do that. 
Uh, Excel has this great function, so does Microsoft Word, and so does uh, PowerPoint, um, where anything that is formatted a certain way, you can copy that format and paste it to other things. So let's say I want this parsnips things and this carrot uh, box to have all the same properties as this beets box. So I just select the box so it looks like this. Um, and I hit this paintbrush looking thing over here, Format Painter. And then I just click it on the other box. Boom. Done. All right. Scratch that out a bit more. All right. And do the same thing. Boom. All right. That's a lot easier. If you were going to redo something like that. If you, and if you want it to look that way, and it doesn't really matter, but if you do, that's, that's how you do that. Another way, since we're getting down in the weeds here, is if uh, if you don't if you want to avoid all of that, you can just, uh, when you're inserting the text box, uh, you go to where it says text box up here, and there's another option called, uh, hello? Why isn't it giving me options? Oh, oh yeah. This just looks different than it looked last time. Anyway, you get text box here, and then you got this thing up here called text art. And depending on the version of your Excel you're using, this might look different. I know the one I have at work in my office is not the same as the one here at home. Um, anyway, this thing up here where it says A, click that, and you can you know pick uh, a a look like this or whatever. This is like a 3D, but anyway, you can pick that and. It makes a text box like that. So you can type whatever you want, right? Beans. And then you can make that smaller. Whoops. I guess you change the font. Just go to home and uh, you can make the font whatever you want. Let's say we make it uh, 12 point font. That's a bit small. Make it bigger. Right now, I can take that and put it wherever I want. Right, and it looks the same. That's a one-stop shopping way of doing it as well. You know, in Excel, there's three ways to do just about everything. Um, anyway, let's get rid of that. So that's not what we're doing today. Uh, today, we're going to actually plan next year's garden um, using the information I have from the past summer's garden. So I've got a tab here, 2017 garden. I want to make a new tab now because that's going to be my 2018 plan, right? And this is just the logic I use for doing this. Uh, it's almost like a forecast if you're some sort of uh, financial person. You have four you know, forecast, you got a budget, then you have an actual, uh, if that makes any sense to you at all. Uh, this is the same sort of reasoning. I'm not an accountant, but uh, I, I do uh, review the work of them <laughs> from time to time. So uh, all you got to do is right-click on the tab and choose this option move or copy and uh, click move to end and click this button that says create copy right move to end create copy and that move to end just means put it on the right hand side right um, before sheet. if I put it before sheet then it would be over here somewhere doesn't matter just click move to end create copy boom so now there's a new tab it's called 2000 garden 2 right I'm gonna rename that so just double click it's gonna be a uh, 2018 uh, plan. Oh. plan. Okay, so there's our plan. So now we got to figure out where everything's going to go in this coming year. And, and one thing I should mention, I don't think I mentioned last uh, episode, the entire perimeter, if you, if you can make it out, there's a fence that goes all the way around my garden here. The entire perimeter is a garden as well, so the two feet on the inside part of the fence it's about a two foot, some places it's three feet, but I can't really reach much further than that and I don't want to walk on my soil. So it's about a two foot garden all the way around the perimeter here. Now a lot of that's perennials, like this is strawberries here and and uh, down here in the corner is uh, asparagus and there's raspberries along here and on, on uh, the side over here is uh, blackberries over here and uh, there's, uh, if you go over here there's some you can't see, but behind this giant cucumber garden, there, again, along the border, there's uh, grapes down here in the corner back here. It's rhubarb. So I don't need to label any of this stuff. That's just going to stay. You know, it's it's basically strawberries all the way to here, and then there's a rhubarb patch, and then there's then there's uh, grapes, and then over here there's uh, 
raspberries and then that but there's a bit of space I can jam things in like uh, so in, in front of the raspberries and and along this area last year I planted um, potatoes it was all potatoes and uh, when the potatoes were done uh, and I dug them up I planted chard as a fall a Swiss chard as a fall crop worked out really well so that means that this coming year I can't plant potatoes or Swiss chard there I to plant something else so, anyway. so I got uh, this is all the uh, seeds that I ordered uh, this year. I got my seeds uh, from Vessi's Seeds. And well, more on that later, but they're actually going to sponsor the uh, podcast and YouTube channel to, uh, channel to an extent this year. Putting out content on YouTube or putting up a podcast takes time and it costs money for the equipment and so on. Actually, the podcast actually costs money. And I do not like asking my viewers for money um, you know you watch a lot of YouTube channels they are always saying support the channel support us support us and that's fine and, and I'm not criticizing anyone that does that I just I don't personally like doing it I, I don't when I'm when I'm watching someone else's channel I don't mind that they uh, ask me for donations and sometimes I do if I like their content and you should t you know I recommend uh, doing that uh, if you feel so inclined I'm not I am not running down anyone that does that. That's not my point. I just don't like doing it. <laughs> I don't like constantly asking people for money. I don't like doing it. It bothers me to have to do it. Um, so I worked really hard this year to find a sponsor um, so that I can get enough money to sort of make this all worthwhile. Uh, YouTube does pay money, but I haven't received a cent yet. <laughs> Is there some way to make that happen? I haven't figured it out. Uh, I'm still waiting. There's some thing you're supposed to get from them, and it's supposed to result in money. I haven't figured any of that out. I haven't gotten a dime from YouTube. But um, and my views, I don't, I'm not uh, viral here. So <laughs> you, know, you run a gardening channel, you do it. Uh, at least for me, it's a labor of love. It's not because uh, you think you're going to get rich doing it. So uh, anyway, I looked for uh, a sponsor and I, I found one. And I mean, the way I look for sponsors is I I contact companies that sell things that I use or that I have been thinking about using. I won't just run with anyone. So this year, um, all my seeds were provided for free from uh, Vessi Seeds, um, and uh, and they're also gonna provide a bit of money to um, offset some of the costs that, that come with producing this uh, podcast and YouTube channel. So that's great. But more on that later. I don't want to get into that today. So these are all the seeds that I ordered from them. And it came in really quick. I mean, I ordered this a couple of days ago. I ordered this on Wednesday and I, the package was in my house today, or yesterday on Friday. So that's just great. So these are all the things I would like to think I could plant in that 2,500 square foot garden. Uh, and there's a couple other things I'm going to plant as well. I've, I've saved some of my own seeds, so some of my own stuff is going to go out there too, and uh, and so on. But anyway, this is the this is the idea. And I'm not going to do all of this today. I'm just going to give you an example of how you how you go about doing this. I think it, it's I can't do it all in one setting anyway. I do little bits and, and drips and drabs. And and what I do is you can see this file here. I'll just I'll just put a a Y next to something when I've put it. You know, because you can't keep the stuff all straight. So um, I just go back and forth between the, the picture and the list. And whenever I've given something a home, I put a Y. Done, right? And that way I know what I haven't placed yet. And I'll change this a thousand times between now and planting season. So let's just start at the beginning, uh, I guess. Uh, where on earth uh, should the borage go? Uh, borage is an herb. It's uh, uh, an annual herb. Uh, although if you plant it, uh, it has flowers you can eat, and it's got the foliage can, you can eat, and it's nice and sour. There's lots of different uses for it, and it, it, grow, it has these really pretty purple flowers and uh, attracts bees to your garden, which isn't a really big deal. If you look at my garden, people always talk about attracting bees to your garden, but if you have a large garden with lots of different things growing, uh, there's always going to be flowers in your garden because different things are flowering all the time, and bees are going to be attracted to your garden. Right, I mean, I've got strawberries that start flowering in um, in June or uh, April. April, June, they start to flower. Uh, that brings bees around, right? And I've got different things that are flowering. All I've got, you know, different berries. I've got apple trees. They flower in May. Uh, squash, beans, peas. You know, all these different things are flowering. And if you haven't noticed, my garden is surrounded by a wild area that's always flowering too. So any day of the week 
if it's warm, if you go outside in the summer, all you can hear is buzz. I mean, one of my kids was actually, for one entire summer, was scared to go into my garden because there's so many bees and things flying around there. It just, there is a constant, it doesn't always, uh, you can't really uh, pick it up that well on uh, on my YouTube videos, but it was a constant hum in the garden. There's always bees in my garden. So I'm not planting, even though if you read the package, it says, oh, it tracks bees. And maybe if you're in a, a suburban area or something like that, maybe that's different. Maybe you do need, or an urban area, maybe you do need it to attract uh, bees because you're in some sort of, you know, concrete uh, desert or whatever. But uh, certainly where I am, it's not an issue. I, I plant them because uh, they're, you know, you can, they're edible. <laughs> And I just like them. They're a really pretty uh, purple flower that's uh, just nice and pleasant to look at. Uh, I think my old uh, my old intro for the show, um, there was like a, before I did the, the current intro, there's a picture of uh, Borge, really pretty. Anyway, uh, Borge is one of those things that, um, so last year the Borge was growing. And that's the other thing. Uh, Borge grows and it goes to flower and the seeds drop and they just come back. So I had borage, last year I had borage, or two years ago I had borage growing here. And, yeah, it was right here along the end of this box. I planted a row. And uh, and then uh, I planted something else here this, this year. Last year, for some reason, I had borage growing over here. <laughs> I don't know how it got here. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so uh, what I'm guessing is that you know, I, I, I grabbed all the, uh, at the end of the season, I grabbed all the dead stuff out of this garden and I stuck it in my, a compost pile. And then I threw it on one of these, I think it was just the second to last potato guy, I threw that rubbish in or on this compost, uh, this uh, ogoculture bed here and the uh, seeds from the flowers grew here. But just to give you a sense of how hardy and tough that thing is, and if you plant it, it tends to come back. So I'm inclined to grow that out here somewhere. So I don't know where I'm going to put it out here, um, but um, and maybe just to keep things simple, I'll change the font of these uh, uh, the new labels. Uh, what's some other maybe purple? That's hard to see. Um, I'm not sure what, what color, maybe dark red, maybe. And that's hard to see. There's really no color that's easy to see against because the, the color of the garden is so mixed, it's just hard to distinguish a different color. Even even white doesn't stand out that well. That's not bad. Okay, I'll use white for new stuff. So I'm going to put borage. It's going to be out here somewhere because I don't think the animals are going to eat it. I think they'll leave it alone. Uh, they didn't seem to bother it last year. I mean, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe once they discover it, they won't stop eating it because it's something that human beings can eat raw. So I wouldn't be surprised if animals would try it if they liked it. But and it might be that they didn't touch it because it was in with all these potatoes. Nothing will touch potatoes. Um, whatever I plant outside this uh, enclosure here this year has to be uh, something that wild animals won't eat because this is completely wild out here. There's everything you can imagine. Uh, walking around. I even get, had deer tracks in these gardens last year, um, but they, they're not going to eat potato greens. Uh, they don't know enough to dig them up. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so borage is going to go out here somewhere. I'll probably just put it in with whatever's growing in, in these. I think I'm going to grow some tomatoes out here is what I'm thinking because nothing bothers, at least my experience, uh, all those uh, herbivores don't seem to bother tomatoes. So I think I'm going to put the tomatoes outside the enclosure this year. And yes, tomato and potato are both um, nightshades, so you shouldn't really. From if I'm being very strict with my crop rotation, I shouldn't put tomatoes in any of these boxes because I had potatoes last year, but I didn't have a blight problem out here, so um, I'm not worried about the tomatoes getting blight from the potatoes. Uh, also, all of these boxes I've added and amended this, you know, I've added material to the soil, so. Um, I'm fairly confident the tomatoes are going to do fine out here. Uh, certainly next year, I, can, I cannot put tomatoes or potatoes out here. So anyway, we'll figure, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, don't to, I don't have to commit to anything. That's the beauty of this. Um, uh, cilantro is something I'm going to plant. Uh, uh, where am I going to plant that? Uh, I might plant cilantro out here too, just because uh, it's one of those things that... Uh, 
well, no, I'll, I'll be careful with cilantro. So I'll put it inside the enclosure somewhere. Uh, I'll probably put it down here somewhere. So let me just copy this white box here. Control C. I'll put it over here somewhere. Control V. So cilantro. Uh, I think I'll put it. Uh, I have a, a, a fairly deep. Uh, box. It's almost like a raised bed. You can't see it from this angle, but this is a hill, and so uh, the box uh, is at the bottom of this hill. Uh, there's lots of room here. And plant most of this uh, this area is going. Actually, this is all going to be carrots and parsnips. That's right. I've already decided that. So I don't know where the hell I'm going to put cilantro. I'll just put that here for now. <laughs> haven't haven't decided. Uh, this is not a straightforward linear process. Anyway, I've put the word cilantro in there, so it's it's you know. Uh, it's accounted for. I just haven't given it a home yet. And cilantro is one of those things too, where you're you have to succession plant it. You wouldn't take one of these four by ten beds and fill it full of cilantro because you're going to have no cilantro, no cilantro, no cilantro, and then way too much. And then you're going to be begging all your neighbors to take it, and and then then you won't have any. So cilantro is one of those things you you plant like a, a four foot long row in uh, I don't know May. And then um, in uh, June, you plant another four foot long row. And in July, you plant another four foot long row. Uh, if you're planning to make and, and preserve a lot of salsa, maybe you, you plant more than that at a particular time of the summer and you time it so that it's going to come in when all your tomatoes are ripe and so on. But that's a whole other video. Um, anyway, so cilantro is going to go in lots of different places. Uh, I usually just tuck it in between things because it's a short-lived plant. It grows and then it's ready to pick and then it'll bolt uh, eventually. So uh, whatever, you know, like it's not going to be there the whole season. It's a fairly temporary plant so it's good to put between rows of other things. Uh, that, like early in the season if you have something that's going to get really big um, you can jam some cilantro in beside those things and then once the cilantro is done you just you know, cut it off and eat it, and wh whatever is going to grow there will just overwhelm that space and, and take it over. Anyway, cilantro. Um, this is some sort of dill. I'll put a Y here. I don't know uh, where I'm going to put my dill. Uh, a dill is another thing that um, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a good example of how, actually, I'm glad it's working out this way. It's a good example of how uh, tricky this is to do and why it makes sense to start so early. Um, I, I don't know where on earth I'm going to plant my dill. I usually, again, that's another thing I jam in. I tend to plant it in with wherever my squash goes. That's where I plant my dill because they, they go together. I plant it in with cucumbers. I plant it in with squash. Uh, they seem to get along just fine. The, the dill comes in quicker than the squash. Um, but it'll grow high enough that it's above the squash and it can still get light. And, uh, you know, you, you want to have two, two crops of dill in your garden. You want one crop that you can use for garnishing your food so you can make delicious potato salad and salmon and all those sorts of things if you like that stuff. And then you want another crop of dill that's going to be perfectly ready at the same time you're uh, cucumbers and things like that are ready for pickling because you want as much of that fresh dill in with your pickles as possible for, for flavor. So a dill is another thing. I, 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 I usually companion plant dill. I guess that's where I'm going with this. I usually companion plant dill and I companion plant cilantro. I don't give them their own space. I just jam them in with things. Um, and I think a lot of herbs uh, do well companion planted like that. Um, same with parsley. I don't know. Uh, again, that's another thing that I companion plant. So uh, <laughs> let's just let's just write pa parsley's going somewhere. Uh, maybe I'll give these a little uh, uh, parsley. You know, what, I'm going to put all these uh, up up here in the corner so they're like you know uh, in a holding pattern until I've made some other decisions because these are things that are just going to get jammed in with other stuff in between things. I don't give them their own. Uh, they're, they're sort of like uh, parasites. <laughs> they don't get their own place. They got to live with someone else. <laughs> they got they need roommates. Um, same with this tarragon here. Okay, there's one more thing. So put this over here. I'll just write tarragon. 
All right, so that's done. Uh, now, asparagus. Okay, now we're actually getting somewhere. So asparagus. So in my garden, I guess in this corner down here, this is the left, right? This here's the workbench. Here's the workbench. So this is the left hand. This part over here that we can't see properly. That's what I'm looking at here. So in down in this pocket down here in the corner is where I've got some asparagus. And I originally, my original uh, concept for the garden was that the entire perimeter would be perennials. Uh, but what I'm finding is that the outside the fence, there's all kinds of different creeping rhizome, creeping rhizome type uh, weeds, just different things, primarily uh, blackberry. But I perpetually have things coming in from the outside trying to work their way into my garden. And it's very difficult to have peren uh, perennials along the perimeter because it's hard to eradicate the invasive weeds coming in from outside the garden when you've got these plants along the perimeter that you, do, you don't want to harm, right? You don't want to hurt the blackberry roots. You don't want to hurt the raspberry roots. And you sure as hell don't want to smash or break up all your asparagus. So the original idea was to have asparagus patched down here along the perimeter. And I mean, the ones that I've planted there, they're going to be there and they're going to stay there and we'll just see how it works out. But I have a garden down here. I've got like a number of little gardens along here. And I thought last year I should really turn one of those. So where I had, there was one here I had kale in. It's a garden that's about five feet by five feet. It's a circle. And I got another one here last year that had squash in. I'm going to just move that over to the side. And kale's going to go somewhere. I just haven't decided where. Um, but yeah, it makes sense to put the asparagus in one of these interior gardens away from that edge so I can uh, just make it, uh, devote it to asparagus and maybe some different herbs. Uh, put some herbs in with the asparagus. Maybe some of those herbs we mentioned earlier can go in with them. Uh, an annual herb's a, a great thing to have in with a plant like asparagus because um, it uh, doesn't uh, take up a lot of uh, space and it uh, has different needs and it will also just, you know, a lot of the times it's it's a question of do you want you're probably going to get some weeds anyway so why not choose the weeds that's the way I look at it. I look at it all herbs as, as weeds an herb is a weed that you like right it's not food it's flavor but I mean there's some nutrients in herbs I suppose but mostly you're growing the herb because it adds a flavor that you like to things makes things taste better and especially if you're eating a uh, primarily plant-based diet you have to develop uh, your, your culinary skills to really make that extremely tasty. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to make something taste good if you cover it in butter and cheese and cream. <laughs> but when you lose those options, I, I'm completely lactose intolerant, so I can't use anything like that. Um, then you have to really develop your skill in the kitchen. You have to learn to use uh, a garlic and herbs and different spices. And uh, once you get good at it, you actually find you really you like it, if, if not prefer it. But um, it is a learning process, especially I was raised on you know, buckets of milk and buckets of cheese <laughs> and like all that stuff. But now I just can't, can't, my body can't handle it anymore. So uh, it's good to have lots of herbs. So, and herbs tend to get along pretty well with things like that. So anyway, I'm going to put uh, uh, the, um, I'm going to put the uh, asparagus, I think I got some asparagus seeds. So it's, this is a, a commitment, right? The asparagus is going to take uh, five years to grow. Um, or you know, at least three, but it takes a while for asparagus to become anything worth uh, harvesting, and you really can't harvest it till it looks nice and strong, because uh, you're going to weaken the plant, right? You don't want to be harvesting asparagus when it's young, because the plant's trying to gather energy and grow its root system and all that sort of stuff. So you really, if you're going to plant asparagus somewhere, it means that nothing's going to come out of that space for two or three years, maybe even four years. I mean, the asparagus I got down in this corner, I still haven't harvested. This, this garden was, I think the first year I moved into this space was 2014. And uh, I think this area wasn't even developed till 2015. And I put asparagus there 2015. And it's still really not, uh, I didn't harvest any last year. I just left it alone. I'm hoping this year is the first year I'll get some asparagus out of there. We'll see how it goes. Um, but anyway, it's a commitment if you're, especially if you're going to plant from seed. But the good thing about planting them from seeds, as opposed to planting the, uh, you can you can you can buy asparagus with the roots and everything, but they uh, 
they're still going to take a number of years to to develop into plants you can harvest from. Uh, so m maybe you're cutting one year off of that process, right? So instead of getting six, you know, half half dead <laughs> bare rooted asparagus plants, you can get a hundred seeds for two bucks or three bucks or whatever. So <laughs> to me, it makes a lot more sense because once you have established in my my old property where I used to live. I had an asparagus growing there perennially. Once you've got that established, man, I mean, it's almost like a festival uh, when the spring rolls around. Asparagus is one of the first things that you eat out of your garden. They, they Compared to the ones in the grocery store, they're incredible, the flavor. Uh, my asparagus never made it into the house. They never made it into the house. We, I mean, I like cooked, but, you know, like we, we buy asparagus now and, and uh, cook it on the barbecue and all that sort of stuff. But when I have fresh asparagus growing in a garden uh, you just snap them off and eat them and the, the flavor ah oh, I can't even describe it it's, it's just an incredible flavor to have asparagus in the garden if you've got the space um, and, and you know if you if you've got a garden that you call your herb garden put some asparagus in it right? <laughs> because uh, why not make that uh, space work for you a little bit better so yeah if you like asparagus grow your own asparagus but remember that you're you're not gonna you plant them this year 2018 you're not gonna have any asparagus till 2020 something um, so you know just it's a delayed gratification thing it's gonna take a while anyway so we've placed something and, and I might put it here I might put it here I haven't decided yet uh, which which location um, the play everything that grew here grew really well last year whereas the squash that I grew here winter squash they didn't do very well I mean I got squash out of it but it wasn't um, incredible so I know that uh, whatever I plant and where the squash was, I either need to plant something that has very minimal soil requirements like beans or potatoes, or I need to amend that soil with some more uh, manure, compost, or uh, you know, uh, a mulch that's really going to feed the soil well. Um, those are all things you got to remember, right, when you're doing this sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, we've got asparagus placed, done. Um, and this is some. Uh, Vessi seeds, they, they take great pride in the, their varieties. They have a testing facility there. I plan to do some, at least a, a hope to do a tour of it this summer. Uh, they test everything. They do trials. They develop their own varieties of things. And they really pride themselves in developing varieties that uh, are going to give a good yield. They're going to be disease resistant, uh, high germination rate, and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, more on that later. I don't want to make this a Vessi seed plug. Um, uh, this is some variety of beans. I don't know what, I can't remember. When I was reading the description, these looked good. <laughs> so, Aldrin beans. So, I'm going to plant beans somewhere. And actually, this might be the very place to, to put them. So, uh, let me see if I got a, here, there's a, there's a bean tag right there. So, I'm going to put beans. There's a, You can't see, but there's a circle garden right here. And I'm going to put beans there. All right. So, uh, let me make that white. Is really hard to see, but good enough. Good enough for me. Uh, okay, so there's our beans, and uh, this here is a. If you can see the perimeter of rocks, that's all strawberries. I could probably jam some herbs in there, but I'll, I'll do that on the fly. But this is a strawberry garden. Uh, although I've read that you can plant asparagus in with strawberries, and they and they work really well together. So if I have leftover seeds after I seed this, I'll I'll put this here because this is going to be a. This is a circle garden that surrounds an apple tree. You can see this white thing here, right here. That's the, you know, the thing that protects the, um, the trunk of the tree from rabbits and deer and stuff like that. There's one on this tree here as well. These are there's a row of there's four apple trees here. Um, so uh, this garden is surround around an apple tree. Um, south is over here on this side, and the south is coming from this from this direction here. So as long as the garden's on the south side of the tree, it'll, it'll get reasonably good sun. Uh, and my trees aren't that big yet, so I might have to rethink this this sort of thing when the trees get larger. But uh, I've got an area in my garden where I grow pumpkins, and they're literally underneath fairly mature maple trees. And I got huge pumpkins <laughs> out of those gardens last year. So I think if your soil is really good, uh, and you you know, sure if you have a bad year, that's that's one thing, but uh, 
some things can grow in amongst trees. Certainly, you know, if these apple trees get really big and cast a lot of foliage, you just get more strategic, right? I'll be planting lettuce and, and, and things like a Swiss chard and things like that, that uh, or, or cilantro, things that at the height of the summer, uh, there's a risk of them bolting, right, going to flower. So you, it's okay to have them uh, under a tree. They're still going to get plenty of sun because the sun's, you know, comes up over here, and then it, it's straight up overhead, and then it, it sets over here. This this direction here, the forest at the very bottom is uh, east, and uh, down here, this direction is west. That's north over there. So the sun sort of comes up in the summer, in the height of the summer, that comes up. The sun comes up in the northeast, and then goes straight up overhead, and then it sets in the um, northwest. Uh, this time of year, of course, the sun is rising in the southeast, and it doesn't even come up fully, and then it sets in the southwest. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here. So I'll do a few more of these, and then I'll let you go, because this is going to take a while, and I'm sure you don't want to watch me go through all of this. But I thought it would be interesting just to talk you through the process of making these decisions, to give you a feel for what that's like. Uh, I just do this when I've got nothing else to do and it, it crosses my mind. Uh, I chip away at this uh, over the course of the spring and uh, or, or over the course of the winter. It's just something to do. You're planning. You're, you know, you're getting ready. And uh, I enjoy it because you're getting an idea. It, it's so nice. If I look out at my garden right now, it's just a frozen wasteland. <laughs> it's just there's just snow and ice and you can't eat the soil. It's as hard as a rock. And then you look at this, and you're like, wow, man, I can't wait till that happens again. Look how beautiful that is. This is so nice. Anyway, let's do a couple more here. So uh, these are more beans. I don't know where I'm going to put my other beans. So let's uh, see. So I've decided that I'm going to put beans here. Control C. So I'm going to put beans somewhere else as well, somewhere they haven't been. Uh, I like to put beans in places where I got poor results. So, um, and I got to put them in a place where I didn't have beans last year. Uh, this garden was potatoes, and I had beans here a lot the previous year. Uh, where on earth am I going to put those? Maybe one of these. No, actually, I had beans here last year. Maybe I should put this garden, these squash. I had zucchini here. They did okay, but they didn't do great. So maybe I'll put some beans. I like to. I think of beans as like a fertilizer. Right? If you have a garden bed that didn't do well, uh, instead of putting fertilizer on it or or driving to the, uh, you know, far some farm out in the boonies somewhere, you just plant beans and it'll improve. So I, I wasn't happy with the results. So where those squash were, I'm going to put beans there. That's a good solution. And uh, another variety of beans here. So three different kinds of beans. And I've got other beans too. <laughs> so where am I going to put the other ones? Uh, maybe down uh, where I had these uh, kale. Maybe I'll just put this up here. Put these spare tags up here. Going on. Oh, what happened? I don't know what I just did there. Anyway, control C, control V. So I'll put some beans uh, right here. This kale garden here will become a bean garden. I don't know what this one's going to become. It's going to become something else. All right, and uh, beets. Yes. So. Last year I had my beets here, so all I'm going to do is move them over here. <laughs> That's it. That's pretty simple. I'm right, just going to move them over one. Move them to where I had the carrots. Let's just make this uh, make this white. All right, beets. And a lot of these ones I'll just move them over one because it's easier. It's just easy to keep track of. I can't do this completely, but like like this kale and tomatoes, right? I'll just make that cute. Whoops, whoops! Grabbing the wrong thing here. Careful now. Um, grab. I'll move these cucumbers here, and I'll move these squash here. Something like that. All right. So I'll uh, I'll do the rest of this and show you the finished product when I'm done. I'll do a first pass. I'll do a first pass today and show you what that looks like. Uh, I'm not going to 
drag you through this whole thing, but this gives you some idea, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, just to give you some idea of the considerations. All right, so uh, check back with you in an hour when I'm done this. Okay, so we're back, and uh, I've, I'm not done, but I'm I don't know 90% done. But that said, I'm going to move things around and rearrange and rethink and reconsider and so on. And I can guarantee you, at the end of the season, all of these things aren't going to be where uh, I planned for them to go because I'll change my mind again, and that's fine. But at least this gives you a place to start and gets you thinking about it and thinking about the companion planning and the relationships and so on. Uh, just a quick uh, rundown of some of these different uh, decisions I've made and so on. Uh, here, uh, you notice a lot of times it says peas and potatoes, peas and potatoes, peas and potatoes. And it's something I discovered last year that if you have a garden, I, I did it down here where it says lettuce. I planted a row of peas down the center of this garden. Um, and then I put, uh, even though they were bush peas, bush peas don't stand up on their own. When you, when you live in a, a northern place where I live, um, the, the tall climbing peas, you can grow them, but they, they take a lot longer to come in. So I like to plant the bush peas because they come in a lot quicker. Um, but even bush peas, uh, bush beans don't need any help to stand up, but bush peas do. So uh, just, you just plant a row of them down the center, and you put uh, two-foot-high chicken wire down the center with a couple sticks to hold it up. And the peas will go up that center. And then all around on, the, on either side of that row, I planted potatoes. And they got along just fine. The peas are growing above. The peas come in faster. And they grow above the potatoes, and the potatoes, as the potatoes come in, um, they seem to be everything seems to be just the right height, so you can get something out of both. So it worked really well. So I decided for all the gar uh, potatoes I grow inside the garden enclosure, they're going to be because you can't have peas outside the enclosure. The animals will get to those; they love them. Uh, they'll eat pea and potatoes. So I had a garden down here. I did a video on it. Produced very poorly last year. Plant peas and potatoes here. Um, this is a neat thing to mention over here too. This, so this whole corner here, this whole perimeter is all strawberries, but the corner right here, I've got a problem. There's some sort of invasive weed coming in. There's a patch here, almost eight feet wide, that is just overrun with weeds, and the strawberries aren't doing well. And there's a lot of shade here anyway. Uh, but anyway, the main problem is I think it's a combination of the, the shade isn't uh, favorable to strawberries and the weeds are a real problem so rather than weed this which is a real pain uh, what I've decided to do, to do is to just uh, I'm gonna do a root stout if you watch my video where I build a root stout garden in five minutes it's so quick and easy in this corner here where I'm having a real weed problem I'm just gonna put potatoes down put manure over the potatoes put a bunch of hay down and put some peas in it too and I'll just have potatoes and peas growing here and hopefully that'll smother out the uh, the weeds. The, the weed is a, believe it or not, ironically, it's a wild strawberry, uh, but it doesn't really produce that much, and it, it's it's really invasive, like it's trying to creep into the garden, and it's just not a variety that I want. I want big, juicy red strawberries. I don't want wild strawberries there. And they don't produce enough, and they're just not a good use of, of my space. If I had infinite space, sure, I'd be wonderful to let everything get along, but I'm not in that situation. So that's why I do that sort of thing. And some of these other places, things will be um, planted together. Um, what's an example of that? Um, oh, if I go down here. So it says leeks, borage, onions. So these five gardens here, the one on the end here, uh, I planted a whole bunch of garlic here in the fall. So that's a garlic garden. I might plant some uh, some herbs in with that, I don't know, but I've got lots of herbs growing. I've got a lot of perennial herbs growing in my garden already. So if I plant something there, it'll be an annual. Uh, maybe one of these, uh, one of these ones here, the dill, dill and garlic go really well together. Uh, I'm not sure if the animals will eat cilantro or not. Uh, it'd be worth trying. Maybe I'll plant some cilantro out there. Everything will leave parsley alone. At least that's been my experience. Um, so maybe I'll I'll do that out here. But anyway, this is a garlic garden, and the one at the very bottom is a garlic garden. So there's three gardens in between. I think three. One, two, three. So I'm going to go tomatoes, leeks, and onions, and I'll put some uh, borage in with the uh, leeks and onions, and maybe some other other different kinds of uh, plants like that. And what I think I'll do with these boxes is on the very end, so on the left hand side, which is the northern side, right? So there'll be sun coming from this direction, sun coming from overhead. Um, I might poke some uh, 
like squash seeds in the corner and train the squash to grow it on the grass, right? So they'll be getting the nutrients from the garden, but they're going to be going out this way. I also think that I might, uh, I still have some room, I make, might make about two feet this way, I might make a, a mound that goes all the way along here, a two foot wide mound goes all the way along and plant uh, squash there, like pumpkins and stuff like that, or potatoes, I haven't decided. But I'm going to keep potatoes out of these this year because I had potatoes last year and uh, once I mapped it all out, I realized, no, I've got no room for potatoes there. So, uh, clearly, I need more garden. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to put a, that's my plan anyway. I might change my mind but uh, when, I, when I start working on it. But my plan is to put a garden here, uh, a mound that goes all the way along this hill. So, let's say, uh, oh, what would that be? 20, 25 feet long? <laughs> 25 foot mound that it probably has uh, let's say potatoes and squash uh, squash on the very top and then potatoes on the sides um, and it'll just be manure uh, manure and, and other uh, it'll be like a hugo culture garden like the one I made if you see the video I, I did on how to make a hugo culture I think this onion, this garden right here was hugo culture uh, I'm gonna use that general approach here maybe I'll film that alright so anyway there's a sense of how I do all this and the, the kind of thinking that goes into it and uh, the, the, the free association uh, I don't know we're kind of all over the place this uh, video I hope uh, that was helpful for you um, I mean uh, I'm sure I could have done this in half the time and gotten to the point a little bit better but I think it's useful to you know, just listen to another gardener mull things over and, and play with ideas and so on I, I don't know you'll have to let me know in the comments what you thought of this sort of thing if you like this sort of thing if you if you want more or less of it or whatever it, it doesn't matter to me uh, I just want to be uh, helpful to people and, and provide content that people find useful so um, I hope that was helpful I hope you enjoyed that um, if you uh, really like this content uh, share it on your social media uh, give me a like subscribe all that good stuff and uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun planning your garden. Thanks for watching.